Good evening and welcome to tonight's session of Toolkits Live. Um, I'm Mira Schlossberg. I would like to acknowledge first that we're broadcasting on stolen lands. We're broadcasting from the stolen lands of the Wurundjeri and the Boon Wurrung peoples of the Kulin Nation. We pay our respects to elders past and present and extend that respect to any First Nations people tuning in tonight. Um, and we extend this respect to elders of the lands on which this broadcast reaches as well. This was and is and always will be Aboriginal land. If you aren't familiar with Express Media, it's a vital organization essential to the literary arts and broader communities. It's acknowledged and valued as the peak organization for young Australian writers aged 12 to 30. For the past 30 years, Express Media has been developing, supporting and promoting young writers through workshops that develop skills, through opportunities for constructive feedback and publication and through awards and programs that recognize excellence. Toolkits is a rigorous 12-week program for writers age 30 and under to develop their skills in a unique and exciting online environment. Each program includes one-on-one -on -one mentoring and feedback from an established writer, specialized presentations from guest artists, and the opportunity to network with other young people working in the same literary form. Toolkits is made possible through the generous support of the Copyright Agency Cultural Fund. And these Toolkits Live sessions are presented by Express Media in partnership with Regional Arts Victoria as part of the Arts Connect series funded by the federal government's Regional Arts Fund. So welcome to our second Toolkits Live for Graphic Narratives. Um, for the first time in 2019, Express Media is presenting Toolkits Graphic Narratives, an online course in the form, skills, and ethics of creating graphic narratives. This program combines theoretical approaches, practical exercises, and one-on-one -on -one mentorship to guide young writers through the development of their work. Uh, I'm Mira Schlossberg. I'm a writer, editor, and comics artist, and I'm the facilitator of Toolkit's Graphic Narratives. And this is Eloise Grill. Eloise is an award-winning essayist, comics artist, and poet. Her debut comics chapbook, Sexy Female Murderesses, has recently been published by Blom Press. And her debut poetry collection, If You're Sexy and You Know It, Slap Your Hands, is forthcoming with subbed in uh, <laughs> next month, I think. Woo. <laughs> um, she was awarded the 2018 Willara Digital Prize for nonfiction and her comics column, di oh, for her comics column, Diary of a Post Teenage Girl. And what was that? And um, <laughs> she was awarded the Lifted Brow and our Nonfiction Lab Prize for Experimental Nonfiction in 2018, as well for her illustrated essay, Big Beautiful Female Theory, which she is currently developing into a manuscript for Brow Books. And she tweets and Instagrams at Grillzoid. Um, so tonight uh, is Self Indulgence with Eloise Grills. Personal writing in every storytelling medium gets a really bad reputation, aka criticized by men who have bad taste. Um, but there's no denying that graphic memoir is one of the most important genres of comics. So tonight we're excited to have Eloise here to join us and discuss writing and drawing the self. Um, if you would like to ask Eloise any questions during the Toolkits Live session, you can tweet them at express underscore underscore media, two underscores, um, and the hashtag is EM Toolkits. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so let's get started. Thank you. Um, I would, yeah, thank you very much for having me. And I'm very excited to be able to be here and talking about the, not one of the most important, the most important form of comics, yeah. um, graphic memoir. <laughs> <laughs> so um, basically today I'm gonna go through um, some of the kind of defining factors of what makes a graphic memoir a graphic memoir, uh, go through some examples of some things that I really like and thinking about the ways that we can use memoir as a tool to create uh, really interesting stories that are engaging and that I think build a really strong sense of empathy, um, both for the reader and for the writer. So I've written my little definition here. What is graphic memoir? Graphic memoirs are comics of sequential art that tell an autobiographical or semi-autobiographical story. Because they are a subgenre of graphic novels and comics in general, they may sometimes be referred to more generally as non-fiction graphic novels. I think it's important to note here as well that the way in which 
they are framed as generally gendered or politicized in some way. For example, Mouse is often called a biography or a historical non-fiction comic, whereas um, things like Alison Bechdel's comics, which similarly um, excavate the past and create these kind of historical narratives about LGBTQI characters, um, inherently get called memoir because she is a woman. Um, so, yeah, there isn't, for, for me, there isn't one definition of what a graphic memoir can be. Um, I think mainly it depicts one visual aspect of the self, um, whether that be literally or in other, another kind of form. And um, it kind of can either map out the internal or the external world and tell stories in some way entangled in the real world as it exists. Um, a graphic memoir can also take place entirely inside the head of the writer. Um, it can delve into childhood trauma, it can trace a family lineage, it can focus on one day, one week, it can create a visual language for talking about emotions that fits with that person. Uh, graphic memoir at its best, I think, seeks to understand the self, uh, to interrogate the assumptions of the writer and to search for something beyond what is on the surface of our experiences. It seeks to destabilise the self as a given and to focus on highlighting and exploring the individual lens we bring to the world, giving the reader into an insight into our personality, our feelings, our thoughts and our way of being. I really love graphic memoir um, as a reader because it allows you to inhabit someone else's mind for the duration of reading and to build a sense of empathy for the creator and also for like everyone, I guess. Um, the process of writing memoir is deeply personal. There is no right or wrong way to go about it. Tonight I'm going to be talking about some of the tools that I find useful um, in order to create work about the self, uh, some tips I have for building stories, and what is so special about graphic narratives in their capacity to allow us to share the inner workings of our minds. So I'm just now going to go through some things I enjoy about memoir and some examples from some of my favourite texts. So um, number one, I think that graphic memoir is an easy way to create a contrast or discord from between the interiority and exteriority of the self. So the inner, so what's happening in your mind and what's happening in your body and um, kind of presenting these two narratives simultaneously. So the cap capacity for comics to inhabit both, the inter uh, both of these sides uh, means that there is so much more capacity for play in creating. So we can kind of create this kind of internal, external drama of the self. We can show one thing and tell another and draw the reader's attention to the gaps in our narration. So um, one of my favourite books of the last couple of years was um, T. Boy's uh, The Best We Could Do. I forgot to, um, it, it's actually a hardcover, so I've taken the cover off for some reason. Um, but it's really fantastic exploration of her family's migration to America from Vietnam. And I guess she really effectively in this book kind of intertwines the real world and these really fantastic, like very vivid um, ink wash sort of style. It also creates this really fantastic language for exploring like her dreams and her nightmares. Um, I just, I and um, also for capturing her parents, like their stories and their lives and creating kind of a symmetry and also all these sense of like discord between these different layers of herself and her family. Um, and I love, uh, technically this one isn't 100% a memoir, but Diary of a Teenage Girl by Phoebe Gluckner. Um, it follows this young girl called Minnie Lodge. And basically this film, is, this um, book has been crafted out of her own teenage life and also like par partially fictionalised. And when I kind of read it, I was like assuming that the parts that were made up were the part like were the parts that were actually real. So I thought that the idea that she was having an affair with her um, mother's boyfriend, I thought that was kind of made up, but it was actually one of the real details from the book. Um, so yeah, I think that was really interesting and like kind of playing with my idea of authenticity and what the truth is. 
Um, so yeah, I feel like this is a fantastic book because it's just so layered. Like it includes like text and comics and also like um, just like little illustrations of like little moments from her life. Um, and I think it kind of, with having all these different threads, we get her talking about her um, feeling about herself and her appearance, her love of Monroe, who's her um, mother's boyfriend, and then having this kind of contrasted with illustrations. Um, so it kind of creates a sort of discord between what's happening inside her head and what's actually happening in the real world. And, you know, by things like uh, capturing these surreptitious facial expressions of other characters where um, she might be saying one thing and their face is saying a completely different thing. Um, another thing I like about graphic memoir is that it allows you to interrogate what you understand or know about yourself and the evidence by which you know it. Um, for example, um, Alison Bechtel and Dirk Factor, they both use um, lots of evidence in their books. So this might be things like recreations of photographs or recreations of drawings. So for example, in this one, it's called My Friend Dharma. It's about his friendship with Jeffrey Dharma, the serial killer, during high school. They went to high school together and he recreates some of his actual drawings from high school and intermingles them into the text. Um, and similarly, in both of her books, uh, both of her graphic memoirs, Alison Bechtel is very fastidious about kind of recreating these artifacts and also kind of dramatizing her relationship with them in the text. So for example, she has this series of photographs um, in this book of her and her mother coupled together with um, some excerpts from, uh, I think a, a theorist called Winnicott. And also on top of it, you can kind of see that it's got her ruler and her pencils and things like that. And it's kind of, um, I guess, sim simultaneously like undermining the veracity of her text at the same time as showing how it's constructed, at the same time as kind of demonstrating this relationship between her and her mother through the artifact and kind of interrogating that and what does this particular thing mean about our relationship. Um, and I guess, yeah, I feel like another person I really love for her like raw emotional honesty is um, Mary Looney. Uh, this is her really fantastic graphic memoir, One Good Turn, which kind of com combines personal stories with images and like lots of quite dark and shocking kind of imagery in this way that really, I think, um, in a really generous way, kind of gives us an insight into her um, her mind and her anxieties and things like that. Like this is one of my favorite kind of couple of pages. There's this part where it's got her, like a family in bed and then like, you know, first with them and then with the children and then progressively they age and then progressively after that they become bones and decay and I guess like this is something written quite recently and it um, kind of speaks to a lot of her anxieties about her own life and I guess as an aging person like what that particular um, image means and it's done so effectively and it's done without words and it really yeah I think it's delves really deeply into that very dark part of her mind that we often don't see people illustrating so much. Um, so yeah, I love the way that in memoir comics you can effortlessly intertwine the past and the present. So you can have one narrative thread having conversations with another thread and I'm a strong believer in the self not as a whole or complete being but a combination of competing impulses, learned behaviours and subconscious desires which make up the complexity of our consciousness. Um, and I feel like visual language is an extremely effective way to um, capture this. So, um, yeah, I think, yeah, again, Alison Bechtel is someone who really is fantastic at doing this. Like, she kind of, she kind of dramatises this idea that you can't, um, live and write at the same time because she's trying to 
she's kind of narrating her story and also talking about like how do I narrate this story at the same time as like the character of her is driving on a bridge and almost collides with a truck which is the same kind of truck that ran her like that ran over her father like 40 years ago and like, there's so many so many layers to this and so many different like competing impulses that she's trying to capture and I feel like there's no way you could effectively do that in um, just a written text. Um, how are we going for time and stuff? Um, oh, wow. Okay. Um, and I love that comic, the comics we can acknowledge the fluid, plastic, malleable nature of memory. Uh, you can illustrate alternative ideas and demonstrate the haziness of your perception in a way that I think is um, maybe not as explicit in, um, in text. And I guess, yeah, autobiographical comics can give us a useful way of talking about ourselves and narrating our lives. So creating a language through which to ex um, explore our subjectivity. So, for example, um, Ros Chats has this really fantastic memoir, um, Can't Someone Talk About Something More Pleasant? And it's basically about her um, struggle with her parents aging and suffering from dementia and her kind of trying to, uh, I guess, hang on to some kind of semblance of self as these really devastating events are happening and trying to deal with it with some kind of humor as well. And so, yeah, she kind of, um, like she combines like photographs and she also uses um, yeah, like heaps and heaps of photographs. And like she kind of talks about the chaos of her parents' existence in this text, but um, to see it on the page, like in the photographs, like it creates so much more of a sense of like what it actually was like. Um, and she also uses a lot of like lists and things like that. So this is her going through her parents' stuff and saying, this is what I rescued and decided to keep. Um, and I feel like, uh, with um, comics that allows you to have those sort of different multimodal types of expression, like you can incorporate lists, you can incorporate diaries, you can incorporate all these things without it becoming tiresome or boring to the reader, I think. And yeah, and just like so much variety and sometimes she just like focuses entirely on her life with its quite detailed text and sometimes she uses like quite simple visual metaphors, like this is like her parents' stuff floating away onto an island like that's a perfect visual metaphor for like her um, getting rid of things <laughs> uh, yeah and I think something that people have a lot of anxiety with comics is like thinking about like why me why would I um, be a subject for examination um, and like thinking that it's solipsistic and it centers on the self in an uncritical fashion. But I believe that memoir is the most interesting genre because it gives us genuine insight into how people think and feel and exist. And it allows us often unguarded access into other people's ways of thinking. So I guess the main reason I write memoir is because I love to read memoir. Um, graphic memoir is one of those things that is so exciting because it unveils truths about our existence the ways in which we love and build a sense of connection between the reader and the writer. Um, so uh, now I'm going to talk a little bit about what I'm interested in in terms of my own memoir and my own work. Um, so I guess like first and foremost I'm pretty interested in the confessional in comics um, and not in a completely um, straightforward sense but in the way of like how you reveal things and what that says and things like that. So I'm interested in the diary as a form and the ways in which confession is gendered in poetry and comics. Um, so for example, I wrote um, this, that column, Diary of a Post Teenage Girl for Scum Mag for a while, and I've written that I really wanted to play with the ways in which I kind of confess things to the reader, so using different modes and, um, you know, using visual metaphor, and using self-portraits and 
including like photographs and other kind of ephemera um, and creating this kind of sense of a, I'm sorry, that's one's a bit, a bit rude and nude, but um, like narrating these like everyday moments and like, I guess like because I was doing this in the moment, like I was writing each entry each month and then publishing them. Um, it was very like quite tricky in terms of thinking about like what do I include, what don't I include, and how do I expose myself to people. And I found that I was often most kind of attracted to the things that were about intimacy and the things that were about like uh, I don't know bodily functions and uh, those kind of funny things. Or you know it eventually became. Sorry, like I did this one that was like about me going to get a um, colposcopy, which is like a thing that you have to get to um, your a cervix if you have a um, issue with it. And so I like really like in detail kind of like showed like that's what a cervix looks like, by the way. It's like a weird donut. Um, <laughs> so yeah, just like really honing in on things that were like, what is the weirdest thing that happened to me this month, or what's the thing that made me feel the most or and yeah and then like I started using like photographs as well to sort of explore um, I guess the distinction between like memory and um, reality and how those sort of intersect and undermine each other and things like that. Um, so yeah um, so I guess as you can see I'm kind of interested in work that breaks down these Formal barriers. So, for example, it merges memoir and fiction and photography and drawing and screenshots. Um, so, at the moment, I'm more kind of interested in creating um, stuff that's sort of more hybrid sort of stuff. So, yeah, we're using things like photographs or using, um, but also I'm a bit of a megalomania. So, when I use photographs, they're all photographs that I've taken. Um, <laughs> and yeah, using like creating stuff that's like poetry that I've turned back into text and then sometimes I'll turn it back into poetry again after that. So for example, I have Sexy Female Murderesses which started its life as a poem and then I like slowly developed it into a comic. And yeah, and even within this one, um, Mira and I were discussing before, I have, a comic, like another comic within the comic that is a comic that I've already made, but I felt like it really described this feeling and idea that I was talking about, about this um, kind of, like this dream that I've had consistently that's about um, this body that I've buried in the sense of guilt that kind of haunts me in these dreams. And I felt like I had done it so well in that one that I didn't really want to like do it again. Although actually I did do it again. <laughs> And then I like, because I had another dream and it was about me being Tonya Harding at the Olympics. Um, and there was like a body buried underneath the ice. Um, and I was like trying to like do all these moves so I could <laughs> cover up where it was. Um, I have lots of very vivid dreams anyway. Um, so yeah, I, work, I love work that is kind of very um, humorous and grotesque and um, thinks about like pop culture and um, kind of, thinking about other texts and how I kind of draw, can bring them in. Um, and yeah, and especially, especially with this book, I kind of blurred the lines between fiction and nonfiction. And um, it was kind of like a rigorous self-examination as well as an exploration of the subject matter um, and also uh, creating this sort of world of the comic in which I could control the dynamics of truth and untruth, past and future, and allow these kind of to bleed into one another. Um, and I guess my main motivation for writing and drawing is a combination of emotional honesty, defiance, and play. I love to create work that puts the most embarrassing and painful parts of myself on display because that's what I enjoy most in others' work. And even if it's hard for me, I feel like it's always so reassuring to see in other, like through other people's work, the things that they've experienced and like I find it really relatable. Even if the exact thing hasn't happened to me, I like find that kind of humanness about it, I guess, very reassuring. Um, and yeah, I think I'm pretty, 
I kind of find my process is very kind of cathartic and it's a bit of like a bloodletting. So I'm never really thinking like, oh, you know, maybe not, maybe I shouldn't put this thing in. I'm more thinking like, why, um, why not put this thing in? Why not just put it all there and then sort of um, pair it back? But and generally I'll like put something in and then I'll even push it even further and further. So I don't know. <laughs> uh, not a minimalist in any way. <laughs> um, but yeah, and I think, um, yeah, I think I'm playing a lot more at the moment with like creating uh, illustrated memoir and creating things that like kind of are not quite comics and are not quite um, nonfiction and are not, you know, in this kind of grey zone because I really, I just feel like I like to experiment and maybe it's not to my um, benefit because it means that my work is hard to categorise and therefore hard to um you know, get people to connect with. But I don't know, maybe that's just me doubting myself. Um, but I think the visual is great because, um, you know, you can create the sense of contrast and discord uh, with the text. You can create a sense of elaboration or doubling. So kind of having um, ideas within the text sort of um, be mirrored in the image and then kind of be mirrored back in the text in a way that's quite interesting. Um, you can create visual, rhythms that also echo the text or disruptively and linearity. Um, you can create humour or pathos or anything like that through like, you know, intermingling of text and images. Um, you can create the sort of interior voice. So you can use a variety of techniques to convey the thoughts and feelings of your character. So you, you can, you know, illustrate things rather than writing them and you can kind of um, yeah, use visual metaphor in a way that maybe would feel a bit clunky if you did it in the text. Um, you can play with perspective, like a sense of like playing with scale. So you know how things often seem so much huger and more dynamic when they um, are very emotionally prominent to you, whereas um, yeah, sometimes when things are like less significant, you can shrink them down. And same with time and space. Like you can create a layering of past and present, and they can kind of overlap like waves. Um, and something I've been really interested in doing recently is um, illustrating poetry and sort of creating like double meanings through visuals or creating using metaphor to literalize literalizing metaphor through illustration but, sorry and um i feel like recently i did one for, for going down swinging which was with darling silver so soberano um and that was like quite enjoyable because it was adapting someone else's work into comics and kind of thinking about the visual uh like what the visual element in that text was and how could I play with that and um, I guess what that in those images and ideas meant within the context of that text. So that text kind of really focused on like um, river, the river and water and fish and all these kind of things. So I get, got to really, I love painting water. So I got to really suffuse all that imagery into the text. Um, oh, well, that's gone out. Hello. Um, how are we going for time as well? Uh, we're about halfway through now. Okay, cool. Um, so I guess now I wanted to talk a little bit about process um, and ideas and how we kind of create them. So maybe I'll use um, Sexy Female Murderesses as an example again. So with Sexy Female Murderesses, um, I started off as just like this really quick, silly poem that I wrote about Sexy Female Murderesses. And like obviously the title is a tautology, um, like female murderess that's doubling up with meaning. Um, and thinking about the ways in which uh, we kind of, um, frame female deviance and the way in which this is sort of like the language that's used for this in our society and culture. Um, and there's a few, like throughout the text, I like quote um, some uh, theorists from like the early, 19, early 1900s 
So, for example, on like the first page, I write, it is true that women tend more towards dishonesty, deceit, lies, and hypocrisy than men. These are their strongest weapons, just as man's are his logic, his physical strength, and his willpower. Women love cunning and intrigue, which indicates clearly their awareness of their own frailty. Um, and it's really, I find it really interesting kind of using these, um, yes, sorry. And that's a quote, right? Yeah, that's a quote. It's um, Edward Wolf from, who's a was a criminologist. And the picture is of that, um, is she like a, she's like a Hungarian uh, queen oh, who yeah. used to, sorry? Bathing in blood. Yeah, who used to like bathe in the blood of virgins um, in order to, um, maintain her youth um, so yeah there's a lot going on in this image but basically like i like to use people's words against them especially when they're you know from the past and they can't come and get me um, <laughs> <laughs> but um i think it's interesting when you kind of look at these you know using these textual documents and using these um, per perspectives from the past and um <laughs> using these perspectives from the past and um, I guess like it makes us think a little bit more about like things from the present and you know the way that we kind of accept these kind of scientific viewpoints as being natural and normal and if you look at this from the past you can tell it's absolutely intermingled with culture in the way that it kind of degrades women um so i feel like yeah that's why i like to include things like that because it gives a sense of you know we can all can't always sort of trust these perspectives um and yeah and so it started off as this poem where it's kind of talking about um eileen wernos and how um, she was so much hotter than shelley's was in the movie yeah. and i really love eileen wernos because she's like a uh, a queer icon because she like I don't know she was uh, a gay sex worker who just like you know walked along the highways and you know she was abused and uh, basically experienced all this violence at the hands of men and then she uh, you know had enough and she basically just started killing them um, <laughs> I feel like yeah I feel like this the um, synchronicity between all these women in this text is that like they don't have the capacity or like society didn't give them the capacity to um, be empowered or to be like this like perfect ideal kind of woman and they kind of just took the power that they could take in order to uh, you know assert themselves like whether obviously I don't think it's okay to murder people but <laughs> I feel like there was such a limitation put on these women that they kind of and they didn't even have a language for the particular like the darkness and the things that they had inside them so like they would use these like, supposedly like feminine traits and use them as a weapon like for example like there's heaps of female poisoners and it's um you know like this one woman who is uh, has the same last name as me, but we're not related. Um, used thallium to poison, like basically all of like her husband's family. Um, and yeah, and the idea that like you can use this um, domesticity and this kind of servile role to um, like you can use that to your advantage to and weaponize it against uh, you know people who are oppressing you. And yeah, and I just kind of went through all these different murderers and then it just started to, to get me thinking about like the ways in which um, I guess like thinking about the male gaze and thinking about the ways in which femininity is constructed and the ways in which um, it's also um, demonised and even if it is like women articulating themselves, it's often filtered through um, the, the male gaze. So, for example, like when I start to like explore the and become, the, the text becomes a little bit more conceptual. Um, thinking about you know women, how women fake their deaths better than men because they're used to shrinking into shadow, um, and that they're badly written love interests who shed their motivations like leaves. 
so that whole idea that like um the way that men see women um like when it's kind of reflected back it like reveals this quite this void this absolute void in the ways in which um, women are allowed to articulate themselves and yeah and then it kind of went on from there about me talking about my nightmares and talking about um my own sort of dark feelings and uh, the fact that yeah i still feel like i don't have a language for them and um you know it kind of becomes a discussion about antidepressants and you know i guess like the ways in which um mental health is gendered and that kind of thing and thinking about like you know women are still not expected to have these kind of darker impulses and feelings and we still don't have a language for them and yeah and i guess like even though the text kind of ends with me talking about um you know being in control it's very obvious from like the way that i've drawn this that like i don't particularly feel in control and it's like i guess like me writing this weird little book is like my way kind of a way of me taking the power back but I'm not sure exactly like how useful that is or how much um, like how true that actually is. But I feel like it's kind of a subver subversive act just to do that within the text. Um, so yeah, I guess like with ideas, I think they just got to have like um, a sense of pull. Um, it could be like, you know, it could be something that you happened to you that was funny or embarrassing or painful. But usually it's like when I'm making something, it's like I'm thinking about one thing and then I think about how it links to another thing. And I try to think about like the significance of that and how that relates to the culture that I live in and um, how that relates to, I guess, like these social structures and these power dynamics. And without like, dealing with those in kind of like a very like explicit like this is what I think about this sort of way more doing it as sort of like you know thinking about it more poetically and about the ways in which I um language repeats these patterns and the ways in which those sort of things are designed to make people feel um so yeah and I feel like narrative and comics is a really way, great way to draw continuities between fragments uh and make a story about the random parts of life Sorry, I'm just gonna put my nose. It's getting quite blocked. Um, yeah, I think that's definitely true about being able to draw continuities quite easily. Because you can like literally draw them. Yeah. And you're not, you know, sort of like feeling like you're pounding it into the reader, being like, look here is the connection, like you can just leave them with the image and let them understand it on their own. Yeah, exactly. And I feel like because with um with comics you can kind of time travel and you can stitch things yeah. together and you can just like, you know, you can skip from one thing to another thing to another thing and tie them all together and the reader makes those connections. Yeah. So it's very like I like reading comics because that process is so active. You are just kind of filling in these gaps and creating your own meaning. Yeah. Um yeah, and I feel like with graphic memoir especially, I'm always just like so fascinated by the way that people draw themselves. Like um, like Mandy Ord, for example, like she's got like her classic, like very like emo looking like one eye poking out of like the black hair and always wearing like a stripy shirt. And you just immediately know like, cause I've met Mandy and she's like, very beautiful kind of woman, but like you see how the way that she sees herself and you're like, okay, so like she sees herself as like kind of always being kind of off kilter and quite like uh, frantic and like always like, you know, trying to get somewhere and has all these bags and things. And I feel like it's such an interesting contrast between that, um, the way that she sees herself and then like these very um, astute observations that she has on her work and like she has an extreme level of like empathy and connection and um, noticing the things around her and I feel like it's quite a contrast between this sort of franticness, franticness with it, which she portrays herself um, contrasted with like the very steady observations that she draws. Mm -hmm. Um, 
and also yeah mary looney i love the way she draws herself like just um for example this is one of my favorites of her comics where she is um talking about how she like put all this time into like raising her children and loving them and like creating this you know very supportive environment for them and then they as she says became like fascist property developers and talking about how like she needs to like now like take them out and she just, she's drawn herself with like an eye patch and a gun and like it looks like an outlaw and i just like i feel like I'm just fascinated with the way that she sees herself and kind of the way that she creates these like very like you know gorgeous like almost like children's book illustrations with such incredibly dark content um and yeah and I feel like yeah there's a real kind of sense when you're looking at the way that someone portrays themselves and the way that they portray themselves at different ages and things like that of how they see themselves and how they um, conceptualize uh, the way in which they exist within the world um, and yeah there's a sense of like tension between image and text and I guess like in a sense um, the way that we draw ourselves and the way in which we draw the world becomes our voice in um, comics in a way that like I don't know I guess like a writer's style becomes their voice in text yeah i liked what you said about how the way that you draw yourself is like the container of the voice mm -hmm. and that that like it impacts the voice like like coming from that particular drawing mm -hmm. i think that's really true yeah i think so too um yeah and i feel like also the fact that you can have so many competing versions of yourself on the same page and like within the same book and it still be yourself and be another aspect of yourself i love that kind of like um i can't think of a better word than that. like a schizophrenic quality to it where you just have like all these like competing different versions of yourself and like um you know like sometimes like i include like you know photos of myself that's just one of me looking extremely bored in my bed um and, and then like combine that with like actual drawings of myself and things like that um you know quite like embarrassing like silly drawings like this uh, <laughs> yeah and i think it can you know show the different ways in which we see ourselves so like you know sometimes in this book um Dara, the teenage girl she like draws herself like looking really hot and sexy and then sometimes she draws herself like being like oh i have a huge zit on my nose kind of thing and like it kind of shows different ways in which she perceives herself within those um, parts of the text um but yeah i feel like what time is it now um 6 42 so maybe we can add questions but don't I don't have much of the content. Um, I think one thing that's interesting about Diary of the Teenage Girl is that the way that she draws is really influenced by our crumb. And she talks yes. about that in the book. She talks about being obsessed with crumb and his wife and wanting to draw like them and wanting to be like them. Yeah. And it's really interesting to see like these drawings, which are in the style sort of or influenced by the style of this guy who is like so sexist and horrible yeah and they're like interpreted through the lens of this like teenager who's like trying to view herself through the way that that this artist who she admires is viewing women yeah mm. yeah no definitely and i feel like yeah it's a really interesting sort of yeah especially like that kind of one it's like very like she looks like a crumb girl with like yeah. you know the thick thighs and everything like that and i feel but i feel like yeah like that kind of you know acknowledging yourself as like someone who is objectified but at the same time like narrating your story and yeah. you know kind of complicating that idea i think is really interesting mm. yeah um 
Okay, so I guess we can move on to some questions now. Do we have questions? If you have a question for us, you can tweet it to us. As I said, it's at express underscore underscore media with the hashtag EM toolkits. Um, I had some questions which I have written down. Um, I guess I was wondering if you wanted to talk a bit more about um, this concept that you were talking about of using other texts within comics or like using your own text within a comic, like when you mm. put the comic that you had previously drawn into sexy female wardresses or, you know, like using screenshots from social media, which are like in their own way, a form of like publishing and narrating your life, I guess. Mm. Um, yeah, I was wondering if you want to talk about that sort of like in contrast to the way that you cite and reference and recycle things from like um, like academic texts or like other writers. Do you view that in the same way, like when you're citing yourself versus how you're citing other people? Um, no, not really. Mm. I feel like um, I find when I'm writing and when I'm creating and things like that, I like always um, squirrel away things for later and even if I like cut something from a story or from a memoir or something like that I, I will just like put it to the side and put it in like a little folder on my computer and when I'm stuck with something I'll often like go to this little folder and I'll like find bits and pieces and I'll stitch them into the things that I'm currently working on um, and I feel like yeah and I feel like you know in something like Big Beautiful Female Theory that essay um, I was using a lot of external sources and things like that, but I was also like reinventing them and um, like framing them through my voice and kind of uh, having conversations with them within the text. And I feel like that's something I want to do with all of the kind of media or things that I represent in my in my work. Um, um, I mean, you have a lot of paintings of other paintings, like this cover of Sexy Female Murderesses, and then this one, which is, um, who is it eating its own son? Oh, yeah. So this one is um, Goya, um, mm -hmm. satin devouring his son. And then I've done it as me devouring this, like, younger version of myself. Um, I feel like that was a fun thing to just do as, like, a kind of uh, repurposing of that idea and, like, taking it from that really hyper-masculine domain into, like, this, like, very kind of soft feminine domain but also making it like quite horrific and like making it into like like female monster and also this one is um Belthus which is um it's I can't remember what it's called but it's like this young it's basically it's like this creepy old artist um did all these paintings of this young girl and this is one of her napping and then I put myself as the girl like being objectified by this guy and then like having also like the, that's even in the image like the cat like licking like the cream like how disgusting um <laughs> so i like yeah and i feel like that's like me kind of like making like little little art jokes and being like but what if i i mean my main form of art joke is like but what if i put myself into this picture which i guess is like i feel like lots of people have done that before um but then also like contrasting that with like images like Here's just my hairy legs for some reason. And, <laughs> you know, like kind of using these other languages that other people have created and then like undermining them or using my own language alongside them. Um, yeah, and even like, you know, sometimes I think like it's, like I have drawings and paintings and sometimes I feel like it's not appropriate for me to like uh, draw something or something like that. So I've got like the, um, I can't remember where the, where these ones actually are, but there's um, indigenous um, fish traps which were used to kind of channel um, fish into these particular settings. And I've taken this picture 
from, um, I think that was from like the National Library of Australia and I kind of like incorporated that into the text because I feel like I couldn't effectively do that. And yeah, and then, you know, contrasting my own depiction of this place, Carayo, with like all these like historical depictions of it, all these like photographs and postcards and things and creating kind of a collage um, to kind of contrast these two different modes of expression and contrast like different ways in which we think about place and, um, you know, creating like quite ex expressionistic, like hyper colour ones like this one and then like all these fragments of them that we have in the past and creating something that's quite hyper real because not, like this place can't really be conceived through any image in a very inappropriate or very like um, authentic way. And um, yeah, and also here's me as uh, Venus in the clamshell kind of thing. Like it's all very like tongue in cheek, fun, fun. And then here's me as a uh, Christmas turkey, which I did for this like chapbook of poems that I illustrated. Um, yeah, I feel like it's very funny to like play with a way in which like women have been depicted and the ways in which they are consumed, I guess, through imagery um, in my text. Um, someone has tweeted the question, hi, how does the editing process work for these kind of texts? Do you have several editors with different abilities? Do you find it difficult to be edited because your work draws on the personal? Mm, that's a great question. Um, so I feel like that's the main reason I like started writing comics because I was like, I can submit my whole thing to the person and they'll look at it and they'll be like she drew, drew every single image in this and so therefore I will not edit it because I will feel too intimidated to <laughs> and I feel like um, now I've kind of opened myself up a bit more with that process and um, the main thing that I do actually is I have since I left uni, I have a group of friends, including Mira, um, and we meet up maybe like once every two weeks um, to once a month, and we bring in work and we dissect it and we, um, you know, we edit each other's work. And everyone in that group has a different kind of uh, editing intelligence, and they have um, such a different sense of like what they like and what they. Um, don't like and that kind of thing so it gets such a great diversity of perspectives on my work and it's kind of helped me to let go a little bit of that sense of control and to um, think about my texts and the thing you know my pictures and the things that I create uh, less as um, yeah, making them less personal and thinking about them more as objects and things that I can manipulate and play with um, but yeah and I think also now like um, when I'm creating, like, I'm using a lot more of, like, actual just, like, typed text and images, um, you know, interspersed with that. So often I will do, like, pretty much all of the text first and then I will start doing the pictures because I know they're going to take me longer. Yeah. Um, but with sexy female murderesses, like, you were trapped with us. Mm. Did the publishers edit you at all? No. No. No, but they were basically that, well, that was a very special situation where like yeah. Glong Press were like you can do whatever you want. <laughs> yeah, they can um, and then they can just let everyone do what they want. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, but with um the book I'm working on with Brow Books, I feel like at the moment I'm kind of just in developmental phases, but that might be more of a mm -hmm. um heavy handed editorial approach, but more in terms of like um yeah, I feel like Sam Cooney at the Browse is pretty relaxed about that kind of thing, but more just like it will be more of a kind of inquiring thing of like, but have you thought about this? And do you think maybe you could do this? And that kind of thing, which is much more a more open style of editing. Um, no, I don't think I've had any experiences where people have really, really heavily edited my work, but um, maybe more my text work because people are much more comfortable doing that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was going to ask you, oh, are you allowed to talk about the book that you're doing with Rada? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I guess you haven't gotten to any 
edit have you gone to any editing stages with that? This is a, a comic that um, Eloise is writing in um, partnership with someone else. Yeah, it's a collaboration. Um, so she's kind of writing and I'm illustrating, but we're also kind of putting, like, it's very, like, we kind of just, like, hang out and, like, have coffee together and then I go away and do some pages and then we kind of talk about what she thinks of them and that kind of thing. And I think that's been a really interesting experience because, um, yeah, because, like, I feel like she has her idea of how it looks in her head and then I have my idea of how it should look and they're kind of kind of creating, having that conversation thinking mm -hmm. about, um, you know, like meeting somewhere in the middle to create something that's like not what either of us would have expected that is something that will be exciting uh, at the end. Cool. That's so interesting. Um, this is a good question. It says, how do you go about adapting slash using something you've already written into a graphic narrative? Mm. Yeah, well, that's generally the way I work. So that's a, that's a great question. Yeah. Um, I guess like thinking about like, um, breaking it up, like um, breaking up the text into like very small portions and start, I start thinking about like, okay, what if this um, will work just as images? What needs to be text? Um, what can I transform? What uh, visual metaphors do I already have here and what other ones suggest themselves to me? And I think also it's like, um, it's often it's very intuitive, so I will sort of like, you know, print out the, the text I've written and kind of um, start carving away at it and start highlighting things and start thinking about like, how what's, what is the shape of this thing if I'm going to be moving it into a visual form and um, how, like, what is the rhythm of this page and how can I create something that um, doesn't just, you know, mimic the text but actually um, pushes it into a new domain or pushes it um, past what um, I had already conceived because I feel like um, I'm kind of like I feel like things that are written you know sometimes it's like something should just be a poem or something should just be a piece of written text um, and sometimes adding visuals to that won't give it any extra value but often it's like through the process of like starting to create something and like starting to put things on page that you start to realize that like, oh, actually this isn't, this isn't the right form for this or this isn't the right medium. Um, and I feel like, yeah, the, the um, content should really dictate the form. Well, that's how I feel within my work. Yeah. But I remember with, with Sexy Female Murderess is the way that the content changed when it was adapted from a poem to a comic was so big like at changing it into a comic made space for so much more like factual information mm. um and all those quotes and things that you included and stuff as well yeah for sure and i feel like yeah because i feel like with this one it's just it because i feel like when it was a poem it was like quite it felt quite shallow to me, but then like doing a comic allowed it to um, have all these different layers and have all these different like meta texts within it that if you were, um, like if I was writing this as a um, non-fiction piece or something like that, I feel like it might feel a little bit cobbled together with how many different working parts it has. But I feel like the fact that it's got like, the central, I guess, character is like me, but it's not really me. Um, this like version of myself that's like sitting around in like a nightgown and like kind of being like a, a femme fatale with like my little cigarette and stuff and narrating all these like spooky stories about these sexy female murderesses. And then that form kind of turns on itself and, and it moves into a different kind of, it kind of shifts in genre as you go through the text. And I feel like that's something that's when I'm reading um, other forms of text that don't include visual, I kind of find that kind of switching and changing of genres to be a little bit difficult to follow. And I find it a lot easier. I'm much more likely to um, just like go with it if it's like a visual text, but that might just be because I'm more of like a visual thinker. I'm not sure. I think it's true though. Like it, it becomes so complex 
when you are working in a comics form because you can have like multiple different layers going on at the same time, but it's not difficult to process them all because the reader can take their time with the page and they're processing like through reading and just through seeing. Yeah, exactly. It, like exactly. relieve some of the work that you would have to do if that was all written down, it would become too dense. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And I feel like as long as with comics, as long as there's some kind of consistency mm -hmm. and some kind of like yeah. major thread that like weaves through the whole thing, yeah. then like you can kind of be less stressed by like all these kind of other details and things like that. Like, I don't know, for some reason, um, when you pick up, so this is um, from Marvel's like collection of little like diary entries from pa Patreon. And like, even though like so much of it like shifts and change and it changes and there'll be like one where she's like, um, you know, chatting with like this like lion and there'll be like ones of her just like walking around in nature, um, trying to put a, um, trying to put a menstrual cup in and all these kind of things. And you're, re you're re really willing to go with her on these journeys because we know like every time that we see her, we'll just have like her, um, like her witticisms and this like really funny kind of character. And you just know that it'll just be like this, like kind of like really grouchy little kind of gremlin going around her life and being like, I hate doing this and I hate doing that, but I love you know what I mean? Like, as long as you have that, like, consistency of character or that consistency of world, then, yeah, I find I'm much more willing to take take the plunge, take the journey. Awesome. Um, are there any more questions? Because we're almost out of time. Um, I guess we are going to finish up there then. Thanks so much, Elise, for sharing all that with It's really, really good to hear. Well, thank you so much. That was, yeah, that was fun. <laughs>